We are so very excited to have the Reverend Dr. Marcus D. Cosby, the pastor of Wheeler Avenue Baptist Church of Houston, Texas, as our very special guest today. And um, the first thing I want to say to you is thank you so much for the sacrifice, the time to get here. I know uh, you've really gone out of your way, and I, we and my audience, we really appreciate it. It's my delight. I'm honored by the opportunity. Thank you. Well, thank you. So for the two or three people who do not know who Reverend Dr. Marcus D. Cosby is, what would you tell us about yourself? Oh, wow. Well, I am um, the third of three children, uh, born to the late Rogers Cosby and Mrs. Bobby Cosby, who yet lives and is now living in Houston. Uh, we are from Chicago, Illinois. I'm born and raised there on the south side of Chicago. Side. I think you know something about that. <laughs> and uh, am a church baby, really. I'm one who has always been a great lover of the church. Uh, and the work of the church, and certainly a lover of preaching. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm just that, that guy, that church guy, mm -hmm. who enjoys the work of the church, both inside the sanctuary and uh, likewise in the streets. So that's, that's kind of who I am. Tell us about your preaching mentors. Mm. Well, I think my primary preaching mentor, I know my primary preaching mentor is my father in the ministry, my pastor uh, from my childhood. Reverend Dr. L.K. Curry. Uh, <laughs> he is in a class all by himself. Yes, he yes. is a magnificent preacher yes. and one from whom I've heard the most sermons ever. Uh, and I think for me, um, gleaning from him the way by which he uh, made the gospel simple and plain yet profound, I think that is uh, kind of the way I've tried to, to do preaching, to do ministry, uh, to make it simple so that every person uh, can understand it and make, and make it relevant for every person. I think he has a unique, has a unique way, an uncanny way of doing that uh, every time he stands. Um, he's old school, to be sure, and, but that old school flair works for him uh, powerfully. It is, it is his authentic self, and I think uh, that has shaped my preaching min ministry. And then when I moved to Houston and uh, became a part of the family of Wheeler Avenue, um, the founding pastor is Pastor William Alexander Lawson. And I think I learned from him some things about uh, the preaching ministry and how to communicate to an, a congregation uh, in ways that help people to understand their responsibility to the culture and to the world. Mm -hmm. And so I think uh, those two gentlemen have given to me a unique dichotomous kind of way by which to approach preaching. Mm -hmm. um, I cannot say enough about Dr. Garner Calvin Taylor mm -hmm. and what he has done for me and my preaching life, uh, his picturesque language, mm -hmm. uh, his elocution, um, has always been revelatory for me, has always been amazing to me. And so I've always watched him and was delighted to be in relationship with him uh, in those last years of his life. And so I think, I think those three gentlemen primarily, but then there's so many others who have contributed to my preaching life. And I'm so grateful to all those who have, <clears throat> pardon me, who have made a difference uh, in my life and have contributed to helping me understand the world of preaching, uh, not the least of whom is this man with whom I'm sitting right now. So I want to thank you uh, for all that you mean to the preaching enterprise and all that you have contributed to preaching. The work uh, of your writing and of your teaching uh, have been phenomenal, and I'm grateful to you as well. Well, thank you. Sure. Thank you, man. Thank you. I, I don't know if I've ever told you, but I have an L.K. Curry story. Mm -hmm. I, put, yeah, yeah. I, I put it in uh, my book, Introduction to the Practice. Um, I really usually try to stay out of it. The focus is always on the person and not on me, but I, I do want to just, I was um, a junior in high school and a person, a young person, one of our friends on our basketball team was killed in a botched robbery. And we went to 83rd and Damon. Yes, sir. Mother and father were a member of Emmanuel Baptist Church. And so we sat out there as a disparaged, 
depressed group of young people. You know, young people don't really expect death, know how to deal with right. it. And maybe, maybe now, maybe, I don't know. But yeah, unfortunately. We were just blown away. And uh, Dr. Curry got up, and I had hope when he finished. Mm. Yeah. And I kept saying, how did he do that? How, did, <laughs> how, how do you take people who are in despair? Mm -hmm. And I know it's the gospel, I know it's Jesus, but it was something about the way he preached the gospel and something about the way he, and so he's been formative in my ministry because that's the question that I keep trying to answer as a preacher. How do you take people from despair to hope? Mm -hmm. And he is, I mean, I, I, I'll stop. I invited him to my class two years ago. Really? And he came by and, um, um, Pastor Jackson brought him by and he stayed three hours and I mean it was just a feast so I don't I, the legacy that he brings is is just just phenomenal so well, these these years and of course I grew up listening to him from the first time I heard a sermon I can never remember hearing a sermon even before I knew I was listening to sermons he was the one who was speaking into my life and even as late as this month um, his his ability to make plain the profound, the profound. Mm -hmm. it amazes me. Mm -hmm. I, I, in one season of my life, I used to say, he could take the lint in your pocket <laughs> and help you understand the things of God <laughs> by breaking it down right. to that, that's right. a common denominator. And so I appreciate the way he does it. And now in his, in his 90s, mm -hmm. he's making even more profound uh, contributions uh, to the preaching enterprise and to pastoral work to be sure, but to the preaching enterprise. And it's just amazing to me. It's oh, amazing. Yes, and yes, he yes. comes to our church every year uh, in February. He begins our Black History Month. He's my Black History. So he comes to, <laughs> to uh, Wheeler Avenue every year and our church loves him because of the way he just clearly communicates uh, the, the biblical truth. Yeah. So what is it about that old school generation that either we might be losing or we need to keep it? There's something about so tell me what, from your, your perspective. Well, so I, I think, and this is how, how people have spoken of me, that I, I kind of live in that balance between old school and new school, in that, in that middle passage of old school and new school. I love and appreciate the old school preaching um, authority and the ability to communicate um, in ways that capture all of the senses. I think that is one of the things about the old school preacher, that the old school preacher was interested in capturing all of the senses of the hearer and wanting to make that, that, that connection with the, with the people in that way. And, and the, the ability to use language in, in a way that literally mesmerized people and left you hanging on the edges of your seats. I think that for me uh, is, is amazing. And then the, the drama of the new school and the excitement <laughs> and the passion of the new school. I try to, try to live in, in that balance. I, so I think the old school preacher really helped people to, to understand things in a way that uh, I think we need to uh, hold on to and always commend. And maybe the new school gives you a more passionate fervor uh, for an excitement about, about God and about God's Word. And so I think there is such merit in blending those two. And I try, try to do that. I don't know if I ever have, but I, I try to live in that, in that space. Yeah, very much you do. How would you describe your preaching? A work in progress. <laughs> A work in progress. I, I don't know if there is a description. <laughs> what is that? Uh, but uh, I, I am certainly, I seek to be an expository preacher uh, that tells the story. So I guess an expository narrative kind of preacher. Um, but yes, I love to expose the text. I really do like to draw uh, the nuggets from the text uh, that are just waiting to be exposed to the people. So I think that is probably um, one of the gifts that I've been given is the ability to really pull from the text some of the things that are there uh, and look at the, looking behind it, around it, to see uh, what is not necessarily as easily seen as some of the portions of the text. So that's probably uh, what I seek to do. Yeah. Okay, okay. Now, as when you um, 
when you watch these interviews, we keep trying to get a, de a definition of expository uh -huh. preaching. So I get one, then I say, I do that. <laughs> right, so we have in the, in the program, we got two people who are doing their dissertation on um, expository preaching. One doing on A. Lewis Patterson, and uh -huh. another is African-American expository preaching. So we're trying to wow. drag up, I'm trying to drag up a real definition. Okay. Okay. So I won't put you on the spot. Thank you to give a real definition, but I do want to say to you, we, we're trying to really work through this expository narrative and, and what, you know, because so many of us do such a blending of it. Maybe, maybe something, a third thing is emerging mm -hmm. that, that, okay. that, 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 that illusion. Yeah, 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 right, right, yeah, right. Yeah. So um, a lot of pers people who watch this video would like to know, how do you prepare your sermon? Oh, wow. So, um, that preparation is still evolving, I think. Mm -hmm. I think the more I try to preach, um, the more my preaching and my preparation for preaching evolves. I am one uh, who tries to internalize the scripture. Mm -hmm. uh, so when the text has been, has been revealed to me, I just try to internalize that scripture uh, and make it a part of who I am mm -hmm. uh, and hear from the text. I really like to hear what the text is saying um, in its many ways. And so, and so I, because I pastor a unique congregation that is what we call intentionally intergenerational, mm -hmm. I have to hear the text from so many differing perspectives. Uh, so I'm trying to make the text clear uh, for an intergenerational congregation especially. Um, and so my preparation begins with what uh, Dr. Frank Anthony Thomas calls free association. <laughs> and uh, so I'm just downloading whatever comes to my mind uh, from, from, the, from the biblical passage. And so for days I do that. Um, I, I happen to teach preaching and I tell my students, you really don't want to do what I do. Uh, because it probably doesn't work for most people. Yeah. Um, I prepare sermons on Saturday night. Don't mm. tell the pre preaching professors. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but every sermon I write is written on Saturday night, Are you serious? deep into the dark hours of Saturday <laughs> night. Uh, I usually don't start writing the manuscript until 10 p.m., 11 p.m. Are you serious? For Sunday morning. Yeah, it's it's a sickness, and that's what <laughs> it works. So it, 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 it works. Praise the Lord. Lord. Praise the Lord. It works. <laughs> I would never uh, uh, suggest it to anyone, but uh, so, so, <laughs> so I'm thinking and writing and, uh, you know, putting down my thoughts in note form. Um, and I'm not a technological kind of guy, so everything I do is handwritten. <laughs> go, go figure. I told you I'm old school. I just, it's just sickness. Uh, so, so if a fire so comes you're not through. Doing, you're not flipping it, iPads. No, huh? <laughs> No, sir. If the fire swipe, comes swipe, through, swipe. I'm in trouble. <laughs> uh, so I'm writing, I'm writing, I'm writing, and I have notes everywhere. I just have notes everywhere. And um, by, by Saturday night, all of those notes come some way, in some way, in some manner, form into an outline, and that outline, and I'm an alliterative preacher, so I'm trying to find the alliteration um, and trying to make it make sense. And then, uh, then the manuscript comes uh, at some point. I write the entire manuscript. People have asked me, do I write an entire manuscript? Every single word. I write the entire manuscript and try to internalize that because I don't use notes when I, when I preach. So it's, it's a tricky, tricky business, but uh, God has been kind. I'll tell you, I, I may have told you this before. I, was, um, I went to preach for uh, Dr. Frederick G. Sampson in Detroit. Oh, yes. We went to dinner that night. And I said, Doc, you break every rule that I teach my students. <laughs> yes. So this is what he yes. said to me. He said, I stopped painting by numbers a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. See, 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 see you a master artist. Oh. But you know, so, you know, you, 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 you don't, you don't, you don't paint no, by numbers. It's not good, but I break <laughs> every single rule. I teach one thing and then Saturday night just break it to pieces. <laughs> so a lot of people would love to have an intergenerational church. Mm -hmm. So tell me more about that and maybe any suggestions or whatever you'd like to say about that, because uh, a lot of people would love to have and you. Uh, you know, I've been there, so I, you know, I know. 
definitely what you said is it's a wonderful expression of cross generations and you know all ages working and worshiping and the variety of the worship the beauty of the music ministry your people are just absolutely the easiest thing in the world to, to preach to so talk about this intergenerational sure so i come to ministry to the church um, from the perspective that the church is family uh, and that if the family is going to be as effective or successful as it should, could be, then we have to have all the elements of the family working to provide a functionality, right? Uh, we know much about dysfunctional family and usually there's some pieces missing, some elements missing uh, when, we, when we say that a family is dysfunctional. So if the church is going to be family, if the church is going to be a people uh, that operate harmoniously, that function well, I think it takes all the elements of generationality to do that. I think you have to have the elders, you have to have the children, and everything in between uh, so that everyone is learning from the other. Uh, oftentimes we sometimes we, we make the mistake of thinking that only the younger learn from the older but I submit that the older can lo young learn from the younger and that there is this cross-section of, of appreciation for everyone uh, that makes a church strong so I think part of that is is because it comes from my background um, that old school thing and so I love the elders I love uh, old people. I really do. I just gravitate toward old people. Tradition. Uh, yeah, I love the tradition. So uh, um, that tradition is, is phenomenal. Then I love the ones who just throw the tradition against the wall. And I try to find some balance uh, between the two. So it is difficult sometimes to preach to Wheeler Avenue because of that intergenerationality. Uh, because we want every person to experience, uh, as the scripture says in the, in the book of Acts on Pentecost, the, the message in his or her own language. We want everyone to hear it uh, from uh, their own vantage point, their own perspective. Uh, so it's easier for me, believe it or not, to preach to an older generation, to an older crowd, uh, than it may be for me to preach to a millennial crowd or to a teenage crowd. Mm -hmm. Now I have, uh, I have grown children, who, well, a daughter who is 21, so she's somewhere in that millennial ex experience, and then I have babies, and I have a great teenage population at the church, so it, but it's more difficult. I still have to find ways uh, to reach them because I'm more conversant with an older congregation because of the background of Pastor Curry uh, and his old school ways, mm -hmm. so yeah. So, but it, it, is, it is a, for me, a labor of love every week uh, because when I sit to prepare the message, I'm envisioning all of these people who are coming to Wheeler Avenue Baptist Church that next day. And I want them to hear the message of Jesus Christ in his or her own language. I want them to feel like they know exactly what I'm talking about, that, they, that it was meant for them. Yeah. So you said some of the ways you, know, you have to figure out and to reach that, so what are some of the, the ways you figured out? Or, yeah. So when I said that our church was going to be inter intentionally intergenerational, that meant I had to find ways to specifically target each generation. Yes. So what we did, we put a minister in charge of everyone, but on staff, uh, that that person's job is to reach the seniors. That person's job is to reach the young adults. Our church is sandwiched between two universities. Mm. Uh, literally two blocks on either side is a university. And so we have to have a college presence, a significant one. Uh, we have a whole service that <clears throat> reaches countless college students uh, every Sunday. So I have to have that college minister to make sure that he or she is always keeping me abreast of that, that, that demographic. So I think what happens is those conversations, especially at staff meeting, with all of those people uh, who are responsible for all of those differing demographics, and then the other staff pastors who do what they do, that helps me to maintain a, a, a conversation with every generation. Um, so when I'm, when I'm talking in staff meeting about certain issues and I hear from my young adult pastor and I hear from the college pastor, all of that translates to sermonic reflection for me. So whatever we're talking about is, is fodder for the sermon and it allows me to, to speak to individuals wherever they may be on that spectrum. So I think, um, 
I think having those people there and then hearing from those pastors what they are concerned about with their demographic uh, helps me for Sunday morning. Um, you mentioned uh, teaching preaching and I'm, I'm really excited about your teaching preaching and I've had the chance and opportunity to teach with you and um, learn so much as I was watching you and work with students. Well, yeah, and, and one of the things that I really um, learned from you was the attention to detail mm -hmm. and how you, how you stress to each student. So I'd like for you to give our audience a little bit of, I heard a lot of it and learned mm -hmm. from it. So give our audience just a little bit of that. Yeah. I don't think there's any wasted space in the scriptures. I think that every uh, bit of the scripture has preachability or preaching potential. And I like to look for those details. I, uh, when I went to Fisk University as an undergraduate, uh, the dean of the chapel was a woman named Chestina Mitchell Archibald. And Chestina Mitchell Archibald challenged me while preaching in the chapel. I preached, I'll never forget it, I preached the story of the prodigal son. And after worship, she took me into her office and she said, Marcus Cosby, um, everybody preaches the prodigal, sermon, prodigal son like that. She says, keep turning it, mm -hmm. keep turning it, mm -hmm. find more in it, right. keep turning it. And I, I'll never forget those words. And I think those words have shaped um, some of my attention to detail that I, we know the prodigal story, we know the prodigal son's story, but what else, what is there? Keep turning it, keep turning it. So, so every time I, I, I attempt to preach, I'm trying to turn the text turn it some more. Uh, many have said it's a, the text is a diamond, or the facets of the diamond. And so whatever you know, metaphor you want to use for it, I think there's so much more in the text if we take the time to focus on details and ask God for more revelation about the details that aren't necessarily leaping from the pages, but they're waiting to be explored, waiting to be mined. And uh, so I, I never want uh, preachers to get uh, so comfortable or relaxed with just the surface of the text. There's a substratum element to the text that's below the surface that is begging for some attention. And I think that is, uh, is most helpful for many persons in the congregation because most, many persons, I won't say most, many persons know the story. <laughs> so to just tell me the story, eh, I just repeat what I've learned years ago. But I think there's always something that the preacher is gifted, I, I dare say anointed, to find that is not necessarily leaping from the pages. That and from the moment that people step to that pulpit, as I remember, it's the attention to every detail, mm -hmm. what you have on. Oh, absolutely. So go ahead, go ahead. So, so you see, you see, it's, it's, it's the text, but it's also from the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I teach, I, I, I stress to preachers that from the moment the preacher walks into the room, the focus, for better or for worse, is on the preacher. The preacher is being watched. The preacher is being noticed. The preacher is being examined, especially if it's a guest preacher. But even the pastor, if the pastor is there every Sunday, the pastor is still being watched because people are learning how to be a worshiper. People are learning how to be a church person by the people who are sitting in the pulpit. So if the pulpit is sleeping, eh, you know, you'll have, you'll have a bunch of uh, parishioners sleeping. But, but I think that we have to be cognizant of the reality that there is a, a that we are always teaching as the preacher. We're always teaching. So how we experience worship, how we worship, whether or not we worship. I think many people can remember uh, watching the preachers who would come in, cross his or her legs, and not be moved by anything until it was time for that preacher to preach. That's right. And that is so deleterious, I think, to the experience of worship, that the preacher is not the focus of worship, but the preacher should be a worshiper. Right. And I think that helps to develop congregations, that helps to develop people even before the preacher ever utters a word. And so I, I, I tell people the way you dress is important. Right. 
Um, uh, I stress, you don't have to dress like me. I have a costume, as they call it, uh, that I always wear the same thing when I preach. Uh, I wouldn't suggest that you, if that's not your thing, that you don't dress like me. But when we're too gaudy in our in our in our clothing, when we're too um, when, when our jewelry is making more noise than we are, I think all of those things matter, and they can either detract from the message. Uh, or they could potentially add to the message because of how one presents oneself uh, when coming before a congregation to proclaim what thus saith the Lord. I think we have to be very careful uh, that we're always, as preachers, focusing the attention on the one who has called us and not, oh, not ourselves. Tell me about the most difficult preaching moment <laughs> of, your, of your ministry. Define difficult. Well, how about if I let you define okay, it? I, that's I, cool. I, I, ha I have a definition in terms of whether it was the toughest or hard. It can be, that can be tough personally, okay. emotionally. That can be tough because of the congregation. I Got it. Got it. Yeah. I think the most difficult or the most weighty, may I, may I use that word? The most weighty preaching experience was at Hampton Ministers Conference. No, tell me about it. <laughs> It was, <laughs> ah, it. it was the most weighty uh, preaching experience. Uh, those of us who have gone to Hampton know that, you know, <laughs> the rafters are a rough crowd. Uh, uh, the, the, the congregation on the floor, that's the church. That's the Sunday morning. But up in those, because all the great preachers of our country are, are at that meeting, most of many of the great preachers of our time are in that meeting. And so everyone, because we are preachers, we are always um, um, investigating that preaching moment. I dare say evaluating the preacher and the preaching moment. So that's weighty to have all of these people from all of these different walks of life, all these people who have been preaching forever and who know preaching well and who do preaching well. And uh, then you have the people who just come in to fuss and see what, you know. You Why know. Are they not up there? Yeah. Right? <laughs> exactly. Right. So who is this guy? Why is he there? Mm -hmm. So it was weighty. Um, I was talking to some preachers just last night about, about the Hampton experience. And they were asking me, how did I feel about it? And uh, so after the first day, I, was, I had to preach three days in a row. After the first day, I was back in the green room where they take you. And I said to the assistant pastor of our church, can I go home now? <laughs> Can I go home <laughs> now? I don't want to do the rest of the two days. Uh, so it's just weighty. And um, uh, the Lord was kind, allowed me to preach. But it was just a weighty moment because there's so much that is involved in that experience. So, you know, I, I enjoyed being there after a couple of days, uh, but it was just, a, it, was, it was difficult. It was difficult. And, you know, it, it made it through. So what most, well, you did better than made it through. You did a phenomenal job. But, but what most did you learn from the Hampton experience? I think what, I, what I've learned throughout the years is that we preachers need the gospel. Mm -hmm. um, that we need to be preached to. And it's unique how uh, almost every year uh, the preachers who are chosen speak into the lives of preachers. Uh, because those of us who pour out or tr attempt to pour out every week, we just need the refreshment. Mm -hmm. And so I think it is, for me, I, I think it is necessary for whomever stands in that space to understand that preachers really need the refreshment, yes. the rejuvenation, that we have to take that moment so seriously because that which we do all the time drains us, whether we know it or not. Uh, and so we need, we need that reference. So I think I learned, I've, I'm learning every year at Hampton that there's a refreshment that is necessary uh, for the one who is always expending preaching energy. So when was the time in your ministry that you thought God used you the most? <laughs> uh, I, I don't know if I can pinpoint a time. I, I get such delight um, preaching at Wheeler Avenue Baptist Church mm -hmm. every Sunday. And some Sundays, you know, the moments are, are more memorable than others. But I think for me, and I never wanted to be a pastor. I never wanted to be a pastor. I told the Lord, mm -hmm. I have no desire to be a pastor. 
And the Lord totally disregarded what I <laughs> what I said. <laughs> totally. I mean, just as if I didn't say a word. Uh, but I, I never wanted to do that. But now that I'm doing the work or attempting to do the work of pastoral ministry, I get such delight out of seeing the members of the Wheeler Avenue Church um, who feel some kind of progress as a consequence of my preaching. Uh, so that that blesses me every week. Uh, and we have a lot of church at Wheeler. So every week that we go through that experience of four services. You know I, I call it, uh, you know, you in revival every week. Every single <laughs> week, absolutely. It was a, you know, it's a Sunday revival. It's a Sunday revival, four <laughs> times. It's just Sunday. So I say it's a, a one long service with three intermissions. Mm, so we're right. there for, for eight hours of church. <laughs> and so it's, it's challenging, it's, it's wearying. But um, I think for me to see people grow, uh, spiritually, or to have them acknowledge spiritual growth as a consequence of something I may have said, that blows my mind. That blows my mind. So, although I'm blessed to preach in a lot of different places, I, I love being at that place where I said I never want to be. <laughs> it, just, it just helps me um, to be more appreciative of the gift that I've been given um, to help people grow. Uh, you're not the first person to sit in the chair and talk about home. Mm. You know, we sometimes think that the glory is on the road. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead and speak to that. You? <laughs> <laughs> Since you said, oh, no. Go, no. go, ahead, now. go ahead and speak. Like, say, you, you. So, uh, you know, you're the, the one hit wonder on the road. You go and you take your favorite sermon. And you, as the Lord has led you to, to, to choose a message. But, you know... Those people are excited about that moment. Right. And that's great. You know, we have, well, the gospel does that. The word of God should do that. But to watch development, to watch progress is better for me. I, I, I appreciate that more. Uh, to watch a person from the time she joins the church until 10 years later, or to watch him after he's been baptized as an adult and then become this church person, that means so much more to me. Uh, I love the road, don't get me wrong. I love revival. I, 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 I call myself a revival preacher. I love doing that. Um, but there's no place like home. <laughs> yeah, I love it. One of the things that people enjoy about your ministry um, is the clothes. Oh, so let's talk a little bit about that and um, anything you want to say about that. I could ask you questions, but what would you like? The close of the sermon, what comes to your mind? Well, so preaching has evolved in such a way that there are these multiple celebrations in preaching, and I'm talking to the guru of celebration, but there are these. You're kind. <laughs> you said, no, you're kind. You're kind. <laughs> so when I was growing up, as Curry crescendoed, right? right? So he was making his way, intentionally talking softly at the beginning right. of, of the message until he gets to this crescendo. Yeah, it's just, as that was the way, you know, start low, uh, strike fire, and all that. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Can't remember. Catch fire, whatever. Catch fire, all that, yeah. But now, you know, there's these multiple celebrations in preaching. So whatever your point may be, you're going to celebrate that, bring the people back down, celebrate. And there's, there, there have been critics of that, and of course, there's always going to be critics of every kind of style of preaching. Um, but for me, I am, I think, whether good or bad, I'm excited mm -hmm. when I preach. I'm excited about preaching. I'm excited about communicating this to these people. And so I have, I have a real kind of celebrative preaching style. Mm -hmm. But the close of the sermon has been an, in evolution for the years that I've been at Wheeler Avenue. So Pastor Curry, and I'll keep referring to him, mm. is not a hooper. And I never considered myself a hooper. Mm -hmm. um, and to this day, I don't consider myself a hooper. That's certainly not in the classical sense yeah, right. of hooping. Um, but my close is a celebrative one um, that really wants people to 
feel something, you know. I've tried to learn you something for the last few minutes. Now let's feel good about this. Uh, and I'm intentional about that. I have no qualms about it. I don't apologize for it. I want you happy before I sit down. I'm, I'm okay with that. The gospel is good news. And I feel that you should feel good about good news. So um, it has evolved to be sure because uh, when I went to the Wheeler Avenue Church, I didn't, I didn't close like I close now. Um, I think uh, people have helped me to create a close. Uh, their responsiveness in the, in the preaching moment uh, has helped to create a close. My musicians have helped to create a close. So all of that has worked together. Um, when I, I told you, Gardner Taylor, L.K. Curry, were my preaching mentors, my idols. I focused on the Manuel Scott, I don't know how I forgot his name, uh, Dr. Manuel Scott with his expressiveness. That's when I got free to be expressive. When I started watching Man Dr. Manuel Scott preach, I said, wow, that just, because most preachers had been reserved and until their close. But he was just so excited and so passionate. And I think that freed me uh, to be uh, not a clone of Curry. Uh, but to become whoever Cosby was becoming. And so, um, and, and now what was interesting is when I went to Wheeler Avenue and I went to Wheeler Avenue as an associate pastor for six years and then became pastor, uh, my predecessor, Pastor Lawson, about whom I spoke, never raises his voice, mm. as in not ever. He's very similar to your style of preaching, never raises his voice. Mm. He served that church for 42 years and for 42 years he never raised his voice in preaching. And so the dichotomy between the two of us took some time for the congregation to get accustomed to, <laughs> to be sure. <laughs> like, who is this guy and why? <laughs> so that took some time uh, for, of adjustment. And we had to get to know each other. And we, they had to be confident of my substance beyond the style. Right. And uh, so I think the creation of the clothes, and it's still, and that, Clothes varies sometimes, even at Wheeler Avenue, mm -hmm. to the point that some will come from one service where I am not as expressive, and they hear it in another service. Like, when when did you start doing that? <laughs> what is that about? Uh, but I think that for me, I am intentional about making people feel good mm -hmm. about the scripture. I think it's okay. Mm -hmm. I think we have to free people to be both cognitive and emotive. Uh, one book, I can't remember who wrote it, but Preaching to the Head and Heart. And I, the title of the book captured me even before I read it mm -hmm. because I think it is, as a holistic person, we have to free people uh, to be okay with celebration, with emotion, however it comes. Now, everyone won't celebrate the way I celebrate. And I tell people that's okay, yes. but it is also okay to celebrate. However, you 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 know you feel like you want to separate. So, I think so for for me, uh, my clothes are just an extension of my excitement about God. I really do passionately love God about the Scripture. I really do passionately love the Scripture, even when it challenges me, and about the church. I really do passionately love the church, and I want the church to love God and the Scriptures as much as I do. As you know, we um, sometimes have uh, very difficult transitions between um, pastors. Yeah. And the, the transition between you and Dr. Lawson seems to have gone so very well. It's fabulous. So can you talk about, you know, because as you know, this is a perennial issue yeah. of the transition. Sure. And we've seen some horror stories. Yeah. So tell us about why it went well and what yeah. you might suggest. So the why is, 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 is unique and I've tried to process that. Both Pastor Lawson and I have tried to process that over the years. Uh, I think the why is, uh, the much of the why is centered around a mutual trust and admiration uh, between the two of us. Uh, so the six years that I served with him or served him, served under him, I got to know him, I got to know his heart, I got to know his passion for God's people and for the entirety of the community. And he was teaching me, he was mentoring me 
in those in those elements of of communal pastoral ministry. Uh, one newspaper, when writing an article about another pastor in the city, cited him as Houston's pastor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's the kind of presence he brings to the Houston community. A civil rights activist, no doubt, social justice leader in our community. And so for me, I was able to glean from him so many aspects of pastoral ministry. I came with a strong preaching gift. God has blessed me with that, okay? So, and I think he appreciated that. I really think the two of us were able to appreciate one another uh, for our gifts, for the way God has gifted us. And so when those six years passed after being associate pastor for six years, he made it clear to the congregation there was no one else that he wanted to succeed him. Mm. Uh, we kind of had that understanding years before uh, that I would be his successor. But I think the more we got to learn of each other, the more we got to trust each other, uh, the more we got to admire one another, uh, it was just an, almost a no-brainer. Now, I mentioned earlier, I love old people. I just, I just appreciate uh, the wisdom of old people, the, the, the creativity. I appreciate the sacrifices. Uh, and I got that from my mother. My mother uh, has always had a passion for the elderly. Uh, and I grew up with her taking me to elderly people's houses. She'd take them cakes. She'd clean up their houses. Mm -hmm. So all of that is a part of my upbringing. So that's how I learned that love for, for the elderly. Uh, and I think when I think of Pastor Lawson, I think of one who is such a creative genius. He's far beyond his time. He's 90 years old now, but even in the 60s when he started the church, he was way beyond um, the traditional Black Baptist church mindset. And so I got to see some of that that I didn't grow up with. Uh, so, um, and so because the people knew I loved him and the people knew I, I honored him, they received me. Uh, I told you it was at first not so much because the styles were so different. And there'd been 30 something years of one style and now to deal with my style was off-putting for some at first. Well, they understood me when we got to know one another. And he had me preaching every single week. So when he, when he got to know me and appreciate me, it was just a flow. It was just a flow. And I think God really ordained that. And I think part of what the people appreciated, the, the congregation appreciated was, I wasn't trying to change their church. Mm -hmm. uh, I wasn't trying to obfuscate Pastor Lawson's legacy as pastor. I think, uh, and he, he knew that, and those who didn't know it got to know it, because we still honor him as, as the man who started this church, a great church in Houston, Texas. And I think part of the transition was a bit of trust. So we, we've talked about it in certain settings, and I've had to do presentations on it. And I, I talked about uh, transition, uh, and, and trust as, as the only way to move into positive transition is to have a trust factor uh, that does not let people think you're trying to dismantle everything that has been while creating your own thing. And so that's, that's pretty much what that. All right, so how about from his side? So you've talked to him, that, that's from your side. So what are some of the practices from his side that has really helped the transition? Well, he has never been one who is uh, insecure about who he is, what he does, and, and what others are able to do. So, you know, because of expressive style, some people gravitated toward me. Mm -hmm. And uh, his more cognitive presentation, um, so other people gravitated toward him. And what he wanted to always do is to let people know this guy is really okay. Mm -hmm. He preached a sermon once and it, um, because I'd gone to him, because some negative things had been spoken while I was still associate pastor, and I'd heard of it. He preached a sermon called Bad Grammar, Good Theology. <laughs> a three point sermon. I don't remember the text. Mm -hmm. I have no idea what the text was, but his three points were, be who you is, mm -hmm. use what you got, mm -hmm. and let God handle it. Mm -hmm. That was a life transforming sermon for me because I could see myself changing the 
Cosby style to something that I was not. And he said, I didn't bring you here to be a clone for me. I brought you here to help our church to grow and to expand. Be who you is, use what you got, let God handle it. And when he shared that, and then he shared his love for me publicly, he shared his appreciation for me publicly, uh, it was just clear that this was, and we didn't know each other a year before uh, I got there. We did not know each other. He, um, a mutual friend, his best friend, a guy for whom I had been preaching for years, Pastor Kenneth Whalem out of Memphis, mm -hmm. introduced us to one another. Mm -hmm. his best, he was looking to retire in the next few years. He called his friend and said, what preachers you know, young preachers do you know that could come help me? Wow. And he says, the first name Ken Whalem used was mine. Mm -hmm. And he said, I don't know him. And I didn't know who Lawson was. He called me, had me come preach. We found out we had so many similarities. Our style, preaching styles are different, but our personal similarities are uncanny. And it, we just clicked and he let everybody know, that's my guy. And I appreciate it to this day for giving me a job. I'm very grateful. <laughs> yeah. Yes, and he, he's, he's fabulous. You he know. really is. I've met him and just absolutely, it's a gift. It's a gift, a gift to, to the world. Yeah. What would you like to say about preaching that uh, that I don't have a question to ask you about? Yeah. What what you know we've been together in these moments. What what's on your heart to say about preaching? It could be to whomever, whatever you want to say about yeah. preaching. I want I want just to share it. So from my perspective, we live in some troubling times, right? Uh, from my perspective, governmentally, societally, we live in some troubling times. I am still convinced that preaching is transformational. Mm -hmm. it, it literally can transform an individual who hears qualitative, substantive preaching into a person who disallows the troubling times to really trouble them. Mm -hmm. And we get troubled by the troubling times. But I think the transformational power of preaching can move you to another space, another head space, another spirit space, uh, that literally uh, transforms you. Um, so when I did my doctoral work, and you know uh, of my doctoral studies, when I did my doctoral work, it was all about transformational preaching. My document is on transformational preaching, preaching that changes lives. Uh, I use as, as my motif uh, the woman at the well, how in those few moments of conversation with Jesus, her life is completely transformed completely transformed from being this recluse who doesn't want to be bothered with anybody coming at a certain time of the day um, uh, and to being one who is outspoken and going to tell everyone about Jesus. I am convinced that preaching, that the communication of the good news can change one's personhood uh, from the negative aspects of whomever we are, we all have those to whatever God has really wanted us to be, uh, you know, so we are outspoken and uh, just out of the box about our love for Jesus Christ and, and our re responsibility to the world. And so I think that preachers have to take seriously our responsibility, not simply to, to be dramatic about our presentation, not simply to be so caught up on receiving accolades about our preaching, that we forget the people to whom we are preaching. Uh, I try to tell people we don't preach above people, we don't preach around them, we try to preach to them, mm -hmm. try to connect with people uh, so that they can understand that this good news is for them, that their lives can change because of what we say. Uh, Mr. Rogers is noted as a Presbyterian preacher and uh, uh, he, was say, he was saying to a Presbyterian seminary graduating class uh, that the ground between the preacher's mouth and the hearer's ear is holy ground. Mm. And I think that if we take seriously that space between preacher's mouth and hearer's ears as holy ground, that, that so much can take place in that space, uh, I think we, we, we can really do something in, a, in this world that is troubling, uh, that is troubled, that is almost in tumult, uh, that can leave people saying, 
I'm so glad I have God in my life in the midst of these troubling times. And so I think, I think for me to take preaching seriously uh, is, is absolutely necessary because uh, there is so much going on in those pews. And when I think about how I try to minister to people who are dealing with so many differing, horrific realities, uh, we have to take the time to make preaching portable for people mm -hmm. uh, so that it is not just a sanctuary experience, uh, but we can go into the streets and we can fight the injustices of our time. Mm -hmm. We can go to our job spaces and be a light for Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. We can go to our homes and not be differing, different people outside the home as we are inside the home. We can really make a difference in the world because of the transformative power of the Word of God. I want to thank you for, um, you know, the audience won't know, but I can tell them the tremendous sacrifice that you're making to be sitting here. It's my pleasure. I'm deeply appreciative, and our goal is simply, we have a piece of the African American preaching program, this is what we say, that um, the sheer genius of African American preaching can generate a preaching renaissance to revive American Christianity in the 21st century. Absolutely. So you help us to generate a preaching renaissance. You're being here, some, some preacher somewhere that probably you don't know their name or what time, of, it may be three in the morning, somebody's got the YouTube channel flowing and they're trying to figure out. And so you're ministering to people and I, I just so much appreciate, you know, so I'm first I wanna say thank you to you. Second thing is, I, I want to get um, your feedback to this PhD program in African American preaching and um, just to hear what you would say. Um, sometimes, uh, if you were here while they were in class, they'd all be sitting yeah. here. So you can just, yeah. you know, well, whatever. Um, what, 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 would you say about the, what would you say about the PhD program? Well, I'm excited about the PhD program because you're now giving to the world an opportunity to see and to hear and to learn about a genius that has been kept covered for far too long. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the genius of black preaching has been hidden, mm -hmm. obfuscated to use that <laughs> word again, uh, by, um, by our inability to believe that such creative genius can come from the black church. And so I'm excited that you are allowing us to share in that genius. Uh, of course, I've got friends in the program, mm -hmm. and of course I was asked to be in the program, <laughs> um, but I wouldn't have taken the time off the road uh, to, <laughs> to do the program well, and I know my limitations. Uh, so but I, I, I appreciate your honesty. I mean, when, when I, 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 I worked on you now, I did work on you. Yes, you did, you really did. <laughs> You refuse. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you're right. You're absolutely right. I, I just couldn't see myself doing it um, uh, with the kind of life that I live now. But I, I'm excited. To, I'm, uh, every time I hear my friends lamenting their workload, I laugh. And I, <laughs> I think it is a wonderful thing that you are beating these grown people into submission. <laughs> They are reading 900 books per day. It's a great thing. <laughs> but there's so much that needs to be revealed about this genius. Uh, we have taken for granted that uh, the world has, has taken for granted or has, has had the misperception that Billy Graham is preaching genius. And perhaps for a certain group of people, yes, no doubt. And he did a great work in the world. But there are so many covered treasures, so many hidden treasures uh, that need to be exposed uh, that have helped a hurting people to not only survive, but thrive throughout the generations. I mean, these people who have come in burdened and battered by life and have had this preacher to stand up and proclaim truths that allow them to lift their heads and walk out differently from the way they walked in and survive the cruel world 
the crew, United States especially, in which they have lived, it's amazing to me. And, and so when I think about how the preacher in the African-American context has been able to do that throughout the years, and now people are getting to learn it and study it and then become uh, expert in it and take that and create their own dimension of sacred rhetoric, it amazes me, it blows my mind. And I'm grateful uh, that you are allowing us to do that uh, awesome. Allowing your students to do that, you're beating them. Um, you're, you're just, you know, pulverizing them. But I appreciate, uh, I appreciate every time my friend Dr. Howard John Wesley tells me how angry he is with you. I love it. It's a wonderful thing. <laughs> Man, Frank has me reading a note. I said, "Great, read it all. Tell me about it. I want to learn." Dr. Gina Stewart came to preach for us last week and she had to rush back so she could read something. Great, that's fabulous. Tell me about it. <laughs> Write a paper, send it to me. <laughs> you want to see the fruit, right? Just, Absolutely. I just want to see the I fruit see of the, the labor. Fruit. I promise I'll read it, right. yes, <laughs> while I'm headed to revival. Right. <laughs> well, and I think, uh, I, I, I really do you know, appreciate it, um, you know, your honesty about, and, um, it's a, it's a gift and a calling, just like revivalists is a gift and a calling. And so we, the mutual gifts work together. And so one of the things that we say is so much of our genius goes to the grave. Yeah. yeah. That some of us have to step back yeah. and write and yeah. publish because, man, we've got so much genius in the grave. Absolutely. So Absolutely. much genius in the grave. Uh, to our to our demise, to our detriment. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and the world's detriment too. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All right, sir. So I just thank you so much and uh, thank you for this time. Thank you for the relationship across the years. Deep and profound. Thank you so much. You're a blessing to my life and blessing to this country and so keep doing it, man. Keep doing it and um, we love the family of Wheeler Avenue, oh, and uh, they, they've adopted me as part of the church. Family. You yeah. know it. You yeah. know it. Absolutely. Yeah. So you be blessed. and uh, well. Know, you, you so know you're preaching tonight, so preach yeah, well. Yeah, we'll try. We'll try. <laughs> Hopefully they'll consider it preaching when I'm done. <laughs> That's I will try. Say, Absolutely. Right? I will try. Thank you for what you do. I really do appreciate you and your passion for preaching and your commitment to it, especially black, black preaching, yeah. uh, and for revealing to the world just how amazing this work really is. Uh, so thank you for that. Oh, thank you. All right. God bless you, sir. Thank you, my friend. You may.